Welcome to the Simply Financial Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher Calandra. I have a special guest on the show today. It is Claudia Englisby, attorney Claudia Englisby, who I have known for a number of years, although more recently we've worked very closely together on a number of issues or client coordination together. And I wanted to have her on the show because of her deep expertise and specialization in a particular area of elder care and estate planning, that being uh, special needs. Her firm is Disability Planning Partners, and she draws upon her vast legal knowledge and her personal experiences to help her come up with a modern approach to disability and estate planning. Uh, Claudia, thanks for uh, hanging out with me today. Well, thanks for having me, Chris. I mentioned your firm is Disability Planning Partners. How did you choose the route of disability planning, elder law, and estate planning? You know, the law is such a, a wide open space. Uh, an attorney could specialize in any number of areas. Uh, how did you end up in this particular niche of elder care and the law? It was completely unexpected, Chris just like disability is unexpected. Um, my personal experience was running around Baltimore City, practicing criminal defense when I was first barred. Um, this was in Maryland and my husband's family lived in Connecticut. And I was um, just had my daughter and we got a phone call one morning that my mother-in-law had a catastrophic stroke. And the planning that ensued from that 30-second phone call changed the course of my career completely. So the result was um, my mother-in-law ended up being a quadriplegic without the ability to speak or eat. Wow. And living in skilled nursing care for the duration of her life after the stroke. And what was daunting was being an attorney and not having any idea of who to even turn to, what kind of attorney would help you, where do you seek support for family members, how do you change your life to become a caregiver, all of those issues were just sort of thrust upon the family and we had no idea what to do. So I was very fortunate at that time, my in-law family was very fortunate to um, meet an attorney who basically inspired this path for me. We ended up relocating my family to Connecticut a couple of years later, just to be able to provide some support to um, everyone in Connecticut. And lo and behold, across my desk one day came a flyer from Western New England uh, University, the School of Law. They were offering an LLM, a Master of Law in Estate Planning and Elder Law. Okay. I hit Started a button and I signed up. <laughs> so I completed, that was another three year intensive educational experience. And I think that every single day that I participated in that program, I knew that was what I was supposed to do. Wonderful. So after completing the LLM, I decided it was time for me to practice in my own environment. Okay. So when you're thinking about opening a law firm, I think most folks put their name on the door. Right. Yeah, it's I very wanted, common. I wanted to do it differently. I, my practice is not about me as the attorney. My practice is about my clients. And the idea that if you have a disability need or you have an estate planning need, that you would partner with my team to get optimized legal solutions. I see, that makes a lot of sense. So, so Claudia, you, you're touching on a little bit of disability planning partners. Can you, can you educate me as well as my listeners? You know, I, I, I described you choosing the route of disability planning, elder law and estate planning, but the key element is um, disability and special needs. Is that correct? Am I using the right terminology? families that have disability issues and special needs considerations, that's specifically your market niche that you're, you've built your firm to service? Basically, yes. So estate planning is 
the area of law that transfers assets to the next generation. And that's the foundational work for anything in disability. Okay. Elder law speaks to issues affecting individuals 65 and over. And the disability part of elder law comes from as we age and we have medical interventions that keep us living longer, we might not be able to live completely independently. I see. And elder law focuses on all of those issues that affect our elders. Disability planning was born of the idea that if you are 64 and younger, you're in a very different life cycle. If a disability occurs, if you have a medical diagnosis that is going to lead to disability, or there's a catastrophic accident or injury, like my mother-in-law, those issues impacting younger folks have very, very different planning needs than someone 65 or older, traditionally. Okay. And so if, if there's a listener there that has, let's say, um, young children that have special needs, either physical or otherwise, they are in a position where the advice that they could get from you and your team might come in handy, even though they're not age 65 and older. Is that right? Correct. So we define disability uh, in four dimensions. Um, one of those is intellectual disabilities and autism. That impacts young children and multi-generations of a family. Right. So it's a, it's a greater challenge when you have those situations and getting some professional legal advice that specializes in that area can either, it seems to me, what I would advise my clients, Claudia, is to seek out professional legal advice from somebody that specializes in that area, either to optimize decision-making and to avoid mistakes and pitfalls. And that's, that's what I would advise and have advised people that are in that situation so that they make sure that they're protected, that they get what resources are available in the system and that all of their affairs are in order if there should be a crisis, an emergency, that kind of thing. Does that sound like a reasonable advice that I give as a certified financial planner when I'm working with clients that fall into these categories? It is. And I think I, I think the biggest way in which I can provide guidance is that I know where those pitfalls are. Right. I know what's going to happen if they're not addressed. And I know what's going to happen if a plan isn't in place. So as an example, if you have a young child with an intellectual disability or autism, um, versus a child that does not, parents need to appoint a guardian for a minor child in some kind of legal document. You may have different, you would have different concerns if you have a child that has a disability as opposed to a child that doesn't. So it may take a little bit more thinking and planning and discussions with parents on something as simple as appointing a guardian in the event something happens to mom or dad. So that would be a pitfall, right? Yes. Not being prepared. Let's talk a little bit, Claudia. And, and of course, we're talking in generalities. Listeners, uh, we want to talk about some of the issues related to families at all ages that are dealing with special needs, uh, disability state planning, all of those different things. But don't take this as any legal advice. You should either seek out myself, Claudia, your professional team. We are here to provide education. We're not giving specific advice. That's fair, right, Claudia? Absolutely. But what this do you is find, very general. Yes. What do you find are some of the common in, in your work in this specific area? What are some of the common or major problems that could arise from a disabled person not being prepared with a disability plan. And I asked this question, Claudia, because look, this isn't a fun topic, right? I mean, this is difficult stuff and it can weigh on you uh, mentally. And if you're in a situation where you're dealing with some of this, 
the health care part of things might be a burden enough where you don't even really want to take on anything else. But I think that this is important. And I'm asking because I would like you not to scare people, but to use as an example some of the pitfalls of not being proactive and having a plan by sharing with the listeners what are some of the common and major problems that could arise if you're not prepared. Can you share some with us? Absolutely. The The most important piece of, um, of work in this area is having customized legal documents that appoint an agent to act on someone's behalf. And those documents are traditionally known as um, an agent for healthcare decisions and an agent for financial decisions, which is a power of attorney. If those two documents, if every single individual had those two documents properly prepared, then in the event that a disability occurred, they would have an agent that could act on their behalf and implement any plan. Right. The problem comes in that if you don't have those documents and we don't have capacity, and I mean capacity in a legal, in a legal term, right. um, capacity to really make some decisions, then we're in a court of law under a conservator action and no one wants that. We need to yes. avoid that and it's and, very easily avoided. And, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up that example because uh, I am confronted with that from time to time, not routinely in my practice where something will happen to a client of mine and uh, let's use a classic example, an adult child reaches out to us, wants to give us instructions because the mom or dad are in the hospital, incapacitated, over-medicated, medicated, whatever the case is, but we can't take instructions from them. We can't, legally we can't, nor should we, unless they can provide or we have on file the proper documentation, most notably the power of attorney that you spoke about. And there are instances where that could become a problem if the adult child has good ideas and we're doing things that we would, we're, we would like to do things to protect my clients, but there's that wall and the power of attorney allows for us to work with them. So I'm glad you brought that up. Are there any other examples you could give? Another example, well, let's stay, let, let's stay on the power of attorney for a minute. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, you see firsthand what happens when the document isn't in place. Your hands are tied. There's not much you can do. So while people work, earn a living, save money, and try to be prepared for the future, the biggest pitfall in all of this planning is the inability to preserve assets. So not only is the power of attorney itself important to appoint an agent, but it has to have the right powers. You know, as well as I do, that with retirement plans and some of the laws around spouses being beneficiaries, yes. we, need, we need specific authority within a document to be able to make changes to save assets. And that is the, that's what I see day in and day out that quite honestly is very sad for me because right. not only do you need the document, but you need it to have the right powers. Correct. I understand that completely. And, and I think listeners, this is where the specialization comes in. If you find yourself in this arena with special needs, disability, that this is my opinion now, Claudia, I think you agree, but you probably don't want to throw stones at other attorneys, is that you don't, in my opinion, want to have this work done by the same attorney that handled your mortgage closing and helped you set up your LLC for your business. They're probably good attorneys. They're probably accomplished, may have gone to great schools, may even care a lot about serving you well, but this is so highly specialized that you want to use an attorney and a practice like Claudia's that is immersed in this type of work. And they're not also doing contract law and real estate law and divorce law, that this is 
what they are constructed to do. I think that's incredibly, incredibly important. And I'm not trying to slight other attorneys that are generalists. They could serve a lot of purposes and help you with a lot of different legal needs that you may have, but I don't think it's appropriate in the instance Claudia and I are talking about. Was that too mean to other attorneys, Claudia? Uh, no, I don't think so at all. I like to present it this way, Chris. Do you want your primary care physician doing a knee replacement for you, or do you want to go to an orthopedist? No, oh, that's, right? that's so. Good. It's my knowledge is very, very narrow, but very, very deep. And our probate courts are full of litigation, partly because documents are ambiguous or they're not done correctly. Um, so I wholeheartedly agree with that statement. Okay. And, and do you think, is there a threshold where it becomes too late for a disabled person or a family member on their behalf to begin planning? Um, I would like to say no, it's never too late, but it's there's probably many missed opportunities. Yeah, I get that. And the missed opportunities are simply related to saving assets. So I think the threshold is this, when anyone starts to hear a family member or and or themselves is going to need long-term care, that is the trigger. Okay. Whether there's been pre-planning or not, if long-term care expenses are on the horizon for anyone, that is already an emergency situation. I agree with that. And so I, I think it would be categorized, um, tell me if I'm wrong with this, is it's never too late in the sense that there's probably things that could be done regardless of where you are on the timeline. Uh, but the earlier, the better. And now I'm a planner, right? So I'm, <laughs> duh, I'm going to suggest that you plan. The earlier you plan, the more options, the more flexibility that will be available to you as you move on and time moves on and things evolve some of those options may become closed off for one reason or another. Absolutely. Okay. So let me give you an example. I worked with a couple, a married couple, and they came in, there was a diagnosis of early onset dementia. Um, my client was 56 and they decided to embark on asset preservation plan. So we were able to shelter about $800,000 initially. Several years later into the plan, my client was still functioning very, very well. We embarked on phase two and saved another 550,000. So that if, if we had not begun planning, we would have lost the opportunity to protect over a million dollars. I understand. And, you know, you and I are working uh, jointly with uh, a wonderful couple. And there was um, a small, small example of this in, in the work that we done, uh, we did. And so uh, I'm thinking of that example, too. You mentioned earlier the four dimensions of disability planning. And I know you touched on it, but it seems um, very important. So could you repeat what the four dimensions are and, and give a brief description of each of the four? I love to talk about this, Chris. <laughs> it's my favorite topic. And that's why um, we have you on. <laughs> the first one is um, related to special needs children, autism and intellectual disabilities and other things that fall into that category. The second segment is individuals who are victims of a catastrophic injury, a medical malpractice, uh, automobile accident, workers' compensation. And I don't, I'm not a trial attorney. I'm not a plaintiff's attorney. I don't handle the actual injury cases. But when there is a lingering disability, I do the finishing work and prepare the disability plan along with the trial attorneys. And the third dimension is really speaking to early onset medical conditions. MS, ALS, Parkinson's, 
early onset Alzheimer's, a lot of the dementias, Lewy body dementia, frontal temporal lobe dementia. And those things are progressive illnesses which lead to permanent disability. And it, it's really important that those families start to plan as soon as a diagnosis is rendered. And of course, the last one is our 65 and older, our elders who need assistance to live independently. Very good. In reading your, your bio at your site, it seems like one of the ways you're immersed in this area is through your participation in various organizations like the Alzheimer's Association, the Academy of Special Needs Planners, and organizations like that. Do you find that families that fall into these categories, do they tend to be underprepared when it comes to disability planning? In other words, are there a lot of families that are not preparing as they should in your mind? Or do you think this community of people, if you will, have by and large done a good job getting out in front of things and doing the proper planning? I think that folks that fall into the catastrophic injury are certainly led towards disability planning. I think, you know, if they're seeking out an attorney to make a, to sue someone for the injury, that they typically will get information that a disability plan needs to be completed. Where we often see unpreparedness is with our elders, really. So if I can give you a little um, a little synopsis. I think that in today's world, and maybe you agree or not, but in today's world, we have a couple of different levels of retirement. What I see in my practice is some professionals that are, you know, turning 65, 70, and are stopping, um, retiring from the primary career, and maybe right. continuing to work or not. But these are families where there's health, they're using their savings, they've been prepared. And I call this sort of the good phase of retirement. They're really yeah. active, traveling, whatever, whatever the case may be. The second phase is when they start to slow down. And I think the third phase is when they are really aging. And years and years ago, I think we just saw people at turn 65 and they automatically sort of race ahead to that end stage. And what everybody should know is that there's opportunities for pre-planning at that time of considering retirement. So I imagine your clients, Chris, come in and say, when can I retire? Or sure. give me some guidance on if I retire now. That's a consultation with me that to address a pre-planning need, which may be able to provide additional peace of mind to a client to retire, or even for someone to say, you know, no, let's work another couple of years. That's a really, really important time frame within a family. Yeah, because I think, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking of an anecdotal example, Claudia, but it seems to me when a family is, is confronted with something like this, where there's a, a change in circumstance, or even if they have a child that was born with one of these autism, uh, you know, on the spectrum kind of situations that they're bogged down. I mean, they have a lot on their plate, just, you know, the healthcare, dealing with the doctors and there's it's just overwhelming. so much, it's overwhelming that they might not get to this, not because they don't desire to, but they have so much on their plate that they may not get to it. And as a financial planner, I could see the perils of that. But as just a father and husband, I could see how that could kind of play itself out where that's maybe postponed and not addressed simply because you have a ton of other stuff going on. And uh, if that is the case, they may not be doing the best they can for themselves and their family. And that that's just kind of a shame. That That makes me sad. And I think it speaks to the nobility of some of the work that you and I do. Does that kind of make sense? I don't know if I'm articulating my thoughts right, but does that make sense? I think it makes great sense. I, I 
there isn't a client that I see that doesn't have a concern or a worry. And if all of the issues that you mentioned, medical needs, you know, educational needs, what I recommend is that a family member could provide support to parents. So in your example with a child with autism, there might be another family member that could provide support to parents in working with me or consulting with you just to lessen the overwhelming idea of, wait, I have something else I need to do now. Yeah. You know, it, it's paralyzing. And then we find often that folks are sort of paralyzed to make a decision. Sure. So they need support. You know, we mm -hmm. try to offer a lot of that, but we need support. You know, families need additional supports. Well, I, uh, I greatly appreciate the, uh, the way that you serve and help your community, your specialization. You do wonderful work. I'm a huge fan. If listeners wanted to find out more about you and your team, uh, your website is, correct me if I'm wrong, it's disabilityplanningpartners.com. It is. Beautiful. Good. Well, thank you so much for uh, spending a few minutes with me today. And uh, listeners, I hope you got some value out of this, especially if you fall into this category or know someone that does, uh, perhaps you could give them a helping hand. I will be back with you on the next episode of the Simply Financial podcast very soon. In the meantime, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do so. Uh, that would be great for me. I'd appreciate it a lot. Thanks again. Thanks, Chris. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of Sage Point Financial Incorporated and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. No strategy can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Please note, the information being provided is strictly as a courtesy. When you link to any of the websites provided here, you are leaving this website. We make no representation as to the completeness or accuracy of the information provided at these websites, nor is the company liable for any direct or indirect technical or system issues or any consequences arising out of your access to your use of third-party technologies websites, information, and programs made available through this website. When you access one of these websites, you are leaving our website and assume total responsibility and risk for your use of the websites you are linking to. Securities and advisory services are offered through Sage Point Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, insurance services offered through Elliott Wealth Management, LLC, not affiliated with Sage Point Financial.